Excellence in Citizenship. I want to thank you guys for being here. We're so excited um, to have Nick Meyer here. And tomorrow he's going to be working with the AP World History students who have watched the day after as a way of trying to understand the Cold War and the Cold War anxieties. Uh, he'll be working with the filmmaking students and he'll be talking to the faculty tomorrow. But we wanted to make sure to include an opportunity so that anybody from the community would, would get the, the chance uh, to talk with Nick. Uh, and so he's going to talk a little, uh, I'll, I'll leave it to him about where he's going to do that. But um, before, uh, before we do anything else, and before I introduce Dan Wolf uh, from the Harvard Club to say a couple words, um, Nick does not know that I have this plan and may not have seen this for many years. But this is uh, something, that, a clip I found on YouTube of the making of the day after. Its director is Nicholas Meyer, whose most recent accomplishment was the motion picture Star Trek II The Wrath of Khan. In this case, this film is a tapestry of a whole society. The, everybody who lives and works in the greater Kansas City, Lawrence, Harrisonville area, farmers to doctors, and professors and all the stops in between, all caught up in the one event for which nobody on earth is prepared, which is a nuclear war. Choosing the Midwest as the setting for the movie was a carefully calculated move, according to Meyer. Kansas is really the so socio-economic and geographic crosshairs of the continental United States. It is... Uh, contains representative elements of all those aspects of American contemporary society in 1982, which are endemic, which are typical, and it also happens to be a prime military target because of all the missile silos. And action! There's a lot of cooperation involved in a project like this. The producers of The Day After have called upon the people in the Kansas City area to participate in the film. In fact, about 40% of the speaking parts are cast with local men, women, and children. You won't see a lot of stars. The most recognizable member of the cast is Academy Award-winning actor Jason Robards. Producer Robert Papazian says there's an underlying reason for the fact that there aren't a lot of big names in the film. The story really is the star, and we didn't want to um, neutralize that at all. Uh, we wanted to have everyday people we didn't want to have recognizable stars because it takes away from what we're trying to do with the film. Two local members of the cast are John Grondek Tedesco and Angela Soper, both from the Lawrence area. In this scene, they are part of a Kansas farm family fleeing from the blast. And John, when the wind hits, see it right here? It's going to blow you and you'll back right up into the, into the truck. Against the wind. And you'll probably want to close your eyes because it's a lot of wind. Okay, we're going to have a rehearsal. And short please. Over there, Angela. Over there. All right, let's see the packing. And action. to go on this side. John and Angela are among literally a cast of thousands of local people who will be seen in the day after. You see approximately 1,100 extras are required in some of the scenes. Why are they doing it? Well, a bunch of my friends and I were looking through the school newspaper and there's a big ad and we decided it'd be a once in a lifetime deal that in 10 years we'd tell all our friends that we were in a movie. So we missed school a day and came down here at 6 o'clock this morning and here I am. We just recently retired and uh, we wanted to make some uh, new experiences and have some new things to learn about. Mm -hmm. So this is an opportunity to do something we've never done anything like before. Well, it's not my most glamorous role. <laughs> I'm just real excited about it. I just think it's fun. Why are you doing this? So I wanted to see what, it, what's, what things would look like if something like this actually happened and just to get an idea of how it would actually go. It really scares me. This elaborate scene takes place in Allen Fieldhouse on the campus of the University of Kansas. Here, Steve Gutenberg, one of the film's Hollywood actors, searches for a friend in the gym, which has been set up as an emergency hospital. 
You obviously are going to use a lot of people from this area. We can't make it without it. This movie is made by the people, of the people, and for the people. Everybody's got to be in it. And cut! Print! Uh, once again, my name is uh, Wyatt Anton. I'm the ninth grader at Revolution today. And uh, yeah, I'm a young filmmaker myself. And today I have the, uh, the pleasure of introducing uh, Nicholas Meyer. Nicholas Meyer was born in New York City. He was the son of a psychoanalyst and concert pianist. He attended the University of Iowa, the home of the Writers' Workshop. It was Meyer's award-winning teleplays for ABC's Judge D and Monastery Murders and CBS's Night, The Night That Panic and it launched his screenwriting career. Four months later, he released his critically acclaimed screenplay, The Seven Percent Solution, which remained on the New York bestseller for 40 weeks and won the British Gold Dagger for prime fiction. The Seven Percent Solution was even adapted to an Academy Award nominated film in 1976. After his screenwriting success, Myers had some incredibly impressive early directorial work. In 1982, Star Trek The Wrath of Khan was released, which had been directed and written by Nicholas. And in 1983, this film the day after I came to TV, Meyer's nuclear-themed movie remains the single most watched television film ever made and was nominated for 14 Emmys. Its controversial telecast grew over 100 million views. Other directing credits include Volunteers, starring Tom Hanks and John Candy, The Deceivers, starring Pierce Bronson, Company Business, starring Gene Hackman, Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country, starring Christopher Plum. In 2016, he co-created and wrote the first two episodes of the Netflix series, The DC Masters of Florence, starring Justin Hoffman. The forthcoming projects of his include a feature adaptation of Dan Simmons' novel, The Crook Factor Employed, The Secret Facebook, and he is currently working on another Star Trek project. Also, a miniseries by Nicola Moore, reprising the themes and major issues that were tackled in the Atlantic. His Hollywood memoir, The View from the Bridge, Memoirs of Star Trek, Memories of Star Trek and her life in Hollywood was published in 2009. So, why don't we have a round of applause for Nicholas Meyer? Well, thank you for the, uh, the footage that you found, which bring back memories from so long ago that I can scarcely believe they're mine. Uh, it was interesting to watch those uh, outtakes. Of um, tomorrow I'm going to be speaking again and again and again about the making of the film and my experiences making it. Um, I think that artists are seldom confused with the answer to math equations at the back as though what we have to say is in some way definitive. Definitive is a word, it seems to me, that should never be used in artistic discussions anyway. Um, artists, in my view, are people who put messages in bottles, 
whatever that message is, comedy, drama, sci-fi, whatever it is. But then when it's finished, we lose all proprietary authority over our creations. They are launched into the wide world. And for sure, we are not going to be present when somebody finds the bottle that we've thrown out there, pops the cork, and deciphers what is within. We're not going to be standing behind them and saying, no, that's not gum, that's gun. <laughs> They'll make of it what they will. We can only say at best what we intended, what we thought we were doing. Uh, so I can only say, as far as the remarks that I intend to make tomorrow, Number one, I wish the topic were a more cheerful one. But I don't think it's possible to go through life ignoring stuff just because it's sad or scary. You know what Trotsky said, you may not be interested in war, but war is interested in you. One final note of preamble. The purpose of this talk, believe it or not, is not to depress you or frighten you. It is to inspire you to get involved, to make a difference, to become active uh, rather than passive participants in your own destinies and fates. As we've seen, students from all over the country beginning to get the idea and make big changes. That is what the day after turned out to be all about. So here goes. When I was in grade school in New York City in the early 1950s, we were given dog tags to wear about our necks. This was to help identify our bodies in case of nuclear attack. I don't think I remember the duck and cover drills that everybody talks about, but I, I do remember those dog tags. I have an imagination, which is a prerequisite for an artist. Maybe it's one reason I became an artist, but imagination is also related to paranoia. But is it paranoia if someone is really after you? Whenever I heard or saw a low-flying plane over New York during my childhood, I wondered if it was the one that had come to annihilate my city and myself. As the events of 2001 have shown, my fears were not entirely misplaced. Since 1945, the human race has confronted or failed to confront the reality that we now have it in our power to destroy ourselves. Understandably, most of us prefer not to dwell on this reality. Instead, we ignore it as best we can. We go about our business, watch stuff on our cell phones, play Xbox games, follow sports, study for SATs, and so on. After the World Trade Towers were toppled, President Bush advised us to go shopping. I was no exception to this head in the sand philosophy. I was having fun. I was being a success. In 1974, my novel, which we heard about, The 7% Solution, was the number one best-selling novel in the United States. For 40 weeks, I was Years old. 1982, my Star Trek movie was the best ever, and so forth. Girls liked me. Life was good. It was easy and preferable not to think about bad stuff. You may not be interested in war, but war is interested in. All these thoughts came to mind when I was contacted by an executive from ABC Circle Films, a 
branch of the TV network now owned like everything else by Walt Disney, and asked if I wanted to direct a two-night television film about nuclear war then titled Silence in Heaven. I later learned I was the third or fourth director to be offered the project. The others had passed on it for the very reasons we're talking about. Who wanted to get into this stuff? Not me. Thinking about nuclear war, that was for masochists. Television is all about eyeballs. How many can you get to watch what you're showing? Every year, the competition for those eyeballs and advertising dollars becomes more fierce. After their enormous success with Roots, ABC was looking for a sensational follow-up. After seeing The China Syndrome, a very good feature film that holds up quite well, that virtually predicted the meltdown at Three Mile Island in Pennsylvania, Brandon Stoddard, president of ABC Circle Films Division, hit on the idea of a two-night event depicting a nuclear war with the Soviet Union and its after effects as experienced not by the White House or the Pentagon, but rather from the perspective of ordinary people who would be affected by such an exchange. Teachers, farmers, students, business people, filmmakers, etc. In other words, people like us, shoppers. I'm not sure anymore why I'd read Ed Hume's script on this dreary topic, just so I could turn it down, I imagine. Though you might characterize it as the optimist version of nuclear war, it nevertheless scared and depressed the shit out of me. I was in psychotherapy at the shrink was the silent type. I would lie on the couch and say whatever came into my head. Typically he would say, nothing. In formal psychoanalysis, the patient does all the heavy lifting. But on this occasion, as I lay there and tried rationalizing my way out of directing Ed Hume's script, my analyst surprised me by speaking. Well, he said, I think this is where we find out who you really are. These were terrible words. And on hearing them, I sadly and angrily realized that I would have to direct what became titled the day after. Every morning I have to look at myself in the mirror when I shave. I knew if I didn't direct this film, I'd wind up with a permanent beard. The experience of making the film, I chronicled extensively in my memoir, The View from the Bridge, Memories of Star Trek and a Life in Hollywood. But I'll try to summarize them for you here. I crowbarred a lot of folks into working on the film with that phrase. My cinematographer, Kane Rescher from Star Trek II, The Wrath of Khan, he didn't want to do it. So I said to him, let me understand you. Are you telling me that the one time you get to put the work in the service of your beliefs in Hollywood, you're going to turn it down and bitch instead at dinner parties? I think this is where we find out who you really are. <laughs> and so I went through the process of making this film and learning all sorts of things that none of us really want to know. It had to be a movie that wasn't so terrible that it couldn't be watched because to that remote, people would just click it off. Originally, as I indicated, it was a two-night idea. When I read this script again, it occurred to me that the movie was padded by about an hour. And I remember saying to the ABC executive, do you really think 
anyone is going to tune in for night two of Armageddon. Uh, and I was told, um, you're right, the script is padded. Um, you may be surprised to learn that this is to do with the economics of television. We don't expect to make any money doing this, but there is a limit to how much we can afford to lose. And the hour of script that you propose to cut out represents 30 minutes of additional advertising time a night. So I said, oh. <laughs> Went out and shot the whole thing. Then we came back, and it was time to cut the movie together, and I finished the scene, and I said, well, that's pretty good. Let's move on. And my editor said, we can't move on. I said, why, why can't you? And he said, the uh, scene is too short. I said, what do you mean? It looks right to me. He said, this is when I found out about cutting to measure for TV time. And I said, you know, I can't work like this. So I called up ABC. There was an executive there. Um, I won't name him. Um, he, he was not very intelligent, um, but he was extremely patronizing. He always would say, I'm not going to treat you, I'm not going to talk to you as if you were a child, and he would proceed to address me as if I were a child. Um, but I said, listen, um, X, can't I just cut the movie the best way I know how and show it to you? And then, um, if uh, you want to add stuff back, we can talk about that. And he said, this is standard executive speak, I'll get back to you. So the next day he called back and he said, uh, we here at ABC Circle Films likewise subscribe to the doctrine of first impressions. Now cut the movie however you want. What he omitted to say was that in the time since I had shot the film um, and the time it was time to edit the film, the thing had become such a political hot potato with such as William Buckley and Phyllis Schlafly racing up and down the countryside like Chicken Little, claiming that the sky was falling unless we heard from the Bonu people as well. Um, that all the advertisers had fled. General Mills, General Foods, General Motors, all the generals <laughs> had gone bye-bye. Uh, and so I got to make the book, cut the movie the way I wanted to cut it. And instead of two nights, uh, it was one night right between the eyes. Um, you know, Henry James said, that life is hot, but art is cool. If you are the puppeteer, you cannot be out front sobbing at the performance. You must stay backstage, dry eyed, and ensure that the strings do not get tangled. Which is to say that as upsetting as this material was, I could not allow myself to be affected by it. My business was to make the film and to calculate as coolly um, and dispassionately as possible what was the way to make the film the most effective. I didn't want to editorialize. I didn't want the movie, as Bob Papazian said in that little clip you saw, I didn't want the movie to be about movie stars. Wanted to be about my God, the cinematography was just unbelievable. I didn't want to be accused of goosing people with the music, so there isn't any music. Boom. I wanted it to be like a public service announcement. If you have a nuclear war, this is what it's going to look like. 
on a good day. That's it. No further comment, no editorial note. We got into huge amounts of argument with something at television called Standards and Practices. One day when we were prepping the movie, Bob said we have to go to a meeting. I said, what's the meeting? And we're in the car now, we're driving. And he said, we're going to Standards and Practices. And I said, what's that? And he said, um, he described it. And I said, you mean the censor? We're going to see the censor? Well, they call it standards. I didn't know to get what they call it. <laughs> We're talking about what it is. This is not George Orwell time yet. Uh, I said, oh, I'm not the fastest thinker in the world. So we we're driving down Pico Boulevard, and I said, Bob, um, let me ask you something. If you were going to censor the film, the script, don't you think you should have censored it? Before I accepted to do it, not after I committed to do it? And he said, well, that's just the way it's always done. I said, oh. He drove another three blocks. And I said, Bob? He said, I'm still here. <laughs> I don't think I can be bound by anything that happens in this meeting. What do you mean? I said, well, that's what I said, you know. I agreed to shoot this script, and now it's a kind of bait and switch. You're gonna, you know, do these things to it. So I mean, I'll go to the meeting, but uh, I'm just putting you on notice that uh, you know this is bullshit. That was a nervous giggle from Bob, who's made about 70 television movies, including some really great ones, like The Crisis of Little Rock High. It's not nobody who knows how to do this. But one thing that I understood very clearly that none of them understood, not the ABC brass or Bob, was that this movie was never going to get on the air. That nobody in America was prepared on network television to see such a film. They were all into the flying nun. Or, you know, whatever those other silly things are to sell products. And it was very clear to me, and by the way, you know, we got on to the air by the hair of our chinny chin chin with many disclaimers and many people up front saying, ABC doesn't really know the people who made this movie. We are not responsible. Watch it with a lawyer. Watch it with a priest. Watch it with a church priest. Don't watch it. Um, so we went into this meeting with these a man and a woman. I, I don't know what planet they originally came from um, or how you get a job like this. They said, you know, on page three, uh, where the patient in the hospital refers to his Japanese American doctor as Tojo, that's out. And Bob is like making no comment. And I'm going into this stichomathea response thing where I go, why is it out? And they said, because we will not knowingly insult a portion of our viewing public. I said, you made a television series called Roots, didn't you? They said, yes. I said, didn't you use the N word all the way through that movie? And they said, yes, but that was in context. George Orwell time. And I said, what does that mean in context? You mean if it was about N word, N people? Is that, is that what it means? They go, it's out. Tojo is out. I say that. Um, then we get to the thing about birth control. The girl has purchased a diary. It's never mentioned by name. You never see it. But that's that's got to be out. Uh, I said, why? I said, because we will not take the position of appearing to endorse birth control. Didn't you make a movie about teenage pregnancy? <laughs> um, they said, yes. I said, but you used all kinds of things. I said, I 
no, it was about the end word. I, I don't know. Um, anyway, we went through this absurd exercise. Then I went out and shot the movie. And about 10 days in, we moved to Lawrence, Kansas. And Bob says, uh, you have a phone call. So, really? I'm busy, you know, I'm watching the it's ABC, it's the press. I'm talking to this. It's like, okay. This is like the second, third movie, or third movie I've ever directed. So I'm scared. I go, hello? And I hear the voice, Nick, what are you doing? What, what do you mean? You, you're shooting all the stuff that the standards and practices people said, you know, and you agreed. I said, no way, I stop. I agreed to nothing. I just agreed to shoot the movie that you offered me. Um, but I said, hmm, let me make this easy for you. Fire me. What? Just fire me. I didn't really want to make this whole depressing movie anyway. So just fire me. We're only 10 days in. You know, you'll, you'll get another actor. What? I said, well, you know, if I leave Jason, we'll leave. Um, and also the cinematographer, because he was with me on Star Trek II. Uh, you'll re you can replace those people, and then you'll just um, and you just reshoot a couple. Said, "Wait, I'll get back to you." <laughs> the next day, I'm still shooting the movie. I don't know if I've got a job or not. And this time, I can hear like 20 of them on a speakerphone. <laughs> there. It's your movie. You shoot it the way you want. But as a fiduciary officer of ABC Circle Films, I am legally obliged to tell you that none of that stuff can be in the finished film. I said, okay, you told me. And then I went about my business and shot what turned out to be this two hour movie. I'll wind this up. We, we show the movie to the ABC brands. And these are tough, serious business people. I'm not making this up. They all come out crying. They're all, some of them just are sitting there crying by the end of it. And Bob, my cynical producer, nudges me in the ribs and he goes, well, fool them again. And I thought, well, our troubles are over now. We they love it. And that was just the beginning of the troubles. <laughs> <laughs> then they were intent on tearing the thing into little pieces. And at a certain point, I, they fired my editor because he wouldn't do what they wanted. And I walked off the movie for three months, crawled into bed, and thought I was going to die of grief or else kill myself. That, you know, fun is the past tense of shit. You know, now it's like, okay, <laughs> it's funny. But at the time, it was not so funny. I thought I was going to die. Um, my agent, the incredible Gary Lucchese, was like working behind the scenes to try to put all the king's horses and all the king's men back together again. Um, and eventually, yeah, I came back on, and it was pretty much mortal terror and enmity on both sides. But the thing tottered onto the air, and I found out the next morning that 100 million people had watched this movie, the largest television audience ever. And it will never be equal, because there's too many uh, channel, so I'm the champion. And uh, the way I'll wind this up is to say that uh, the day after, the day after, uh, the press, always eager to be helpful, ran around with their microphones and shoved them under people's noses ad lib and said, Did this movie change your mind? Yay or nay about nuclear war. Oh, by the way, I, you know, I, I should say that the ABC's issue of Nightline with 
Carl Sagan and Elie Wiesel and Henry Kissinger, and I don't know who all of the biggest, most widely watched issue of uh, um, broadcast of, of Nightline ever. Um, but not before the United States government felt obliged to put Secretary of State George Shultz on the air to chill out the country by telling Ted Koppel, no, this is not the way it's going to be. Um, anyway, <laughs> did this movie change your mind, yay or nay, about nuclear war? And then, as I thought rather gleefully, came back to tell me that uh, Mr. Meyer, according to our morning after uh, survey, your, mind didn't your movie didn't change anybody's mind, yay or nay, about nuclear war. What do you have to say to that? And I said, well, I think it's too early to tell or start. And people don't typically change their minds overnight. That's number one. They probably wouldn't admit it to you if they did. Number three, who wants to admit that their mind about nuclear war was changed by a TV movie? Um, and number four, who the hell knows what people really believe Anyway, you say you believe in God, people will give you an answer. But is their answer ultimately accurate of their inmost convictions? Would it be the same under different circumstances? If I say, yes, I believe in God, are they saying it because they think they believe in God, because they wish they believed in God, because they didn't like you to think they believe in God? It's hard to say. And I think some time may be necessary for a person to change their mind, which was right as far as it went. But I had underestimated that there was one person whose mind was changed right away. And it happened to be the President of the United States, Ronald Reagan. Um, there is ample evidence for the effect that this movie had on him starting uh, with his memoirs, in which he relates the effect that it had on him. But also, uh, I got to know Edmund Morris, um, who won the Pulitzer Prize for the rise of Theodore Roosevelt and later for Theodore Rex. Um, Edmund Morris was Reagan's authorized biographer and lived in the White House for three years. And he wrote a rather infamous biography called Dutch. Infamous because he compromised his own historical credentials by introducing himself as a fictional character who was allegedly a friend of Reagan's in the book, which he later explained to me he felt it was necessary to do. Um, but Forgetting that for the moment, he was in the White House when Reagan saw the movie. And he does recount in Dutch, in the book it does, um, but also in person to me, uh, that Reagan was devastated. He said it's the only time he ever saw Ronald Reagan implode. And the implosion continued all the way until Reykjavik meeting with Gorbachev and signing the Intermediate Range uh, Weapons uh, Treaty with Gorbachev. They were going to get rid of all nuclear weapons right there, but Reagan was adamant that he wouldn't give up the so-called Star Wars defense thing, which we all know has proven to be such a success. Um, anyway, that's a capsulized account of my experiences with what to date was probably the most worthwhile thing I got to do in my life. Um, I was talking with Jonathan, who invited me here, and he was talking about teaching uh, children about that time and that place and using the movie to educate people who missed the Cold War. But A, the Cold War has come around again. And B, 
we now have a mental defective driving the bus. Uh, so it's pretty terrifying. What's interesting about the day after and stories that I've heard about it, and books that have been written about it, and there have been books, is how many people were totally unprepared, a lot of them politicians, including a, a general on Castro's staff, who later said that the Cuban Missile Crisis had not been real to him until he saw the movie. Uh, a friend of mine was at the Pentagon at a special screening of the movie for the Joint Chiefs that was convened by the White House and David Gergen this is a childhood friend of mine who was a psychiatrist dealing with terrorists. He was on call at the State Department. He was called in to see the movie. He didn't, hadn't spoken to me in years since we were kid playmates, so he didn't know. He was like shocked. He's, he's huge. And he saw how upset the generals were. Not a titter, not a laugh. They're silent. He said, Dickie, wanted to draw blood over there, he succeeded. He saw one general who was sitting there clearly very upset. And he said, the, the movie upset you. And the guy just nodded. And he said, uh, what upset you the most? And he said, the missiles left the silence. Sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. If I thought Donald Trump could sit through a movie, I would say, well, let's screen it for him or let's remake it. Um, but I know that he has that temperament. Remember Reagan was an old Hollywood man. Anyway, that's the, um, the overview of my experience with the film. And if there are any questions, I will do my best to answer them. Yes. How did it change you? Well, I think it made me grow up in certain ways. As I said before, I was really having a good time under rather severe circumstances. You know, nerdy high school kids go to Hollywood, and that's where all the pretty girls are. And, 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 and being a success, which I never expected in my life to really amount to wasn't a very good student. Uh, I didn't understand things. I was good at one thing, which is telling stories. And it never much mattered to me, and still doesn't, by the way, whether the story was a happy story, or a sad story, or a science fiction story, or as Polonius would say, tragical, pastoral, pastoral, historical, historical, whatever. It didn't matter, as long as it was a good story. And somebody said, what's your definition of a good story? I said, a good story is a story that, once you've heard it, you understand why I wanted to tell it to you. But other than that, you know, and yes, I had protested the Vietnam War when I was in college, when I was out of college. I had marched, I had signed, I had done all that. Um, again, in a sort of self-interest being drafted, going over and getting shot to pieces over something that nobody could explain to me what we were doing there, um, or the moral justification for it. Yeah, I sort of understood that. But this was a rather happy time for me. I was coming off like two or three hit films. It was fun to be popular. And, you know, Jonathan Shell wrote that book, The Fate of the Earth. I want to read it. You know, Stanley Kramer makes uh, On the Beach. I don't want to watch it. We all live with this Damoclean sword hanging over our heads. We know it's there. We know there's enough nuclear weapons floating around the world to kill every man, woman, on earth 54 times over. But I want to upgrade 
upgrade my iPhone. And I want to, you know, see Game of Thrones or something. I don't want to think about those things because they're scary and upsetting. I'm not interested in So I guess the movie got it through my head that I may not be interested in war, but war is interested in me. I don't want to be a prophet of doom. I want people to go out and do something about it. And that's what I did. And that was my maturation process. Now, I'm not entirely a sober citizen, but I think you have to, you have to coexist with all the things that life has to offer. And you can't just stick your head in the sand, or go online and hit, I sign the petition. That ain't it. That's not enough. And that's what those kids um, from Florida are trying to get across. Enough. Yes? I, I was, one, one of the, uh, there was a British film that came out. Threads. Threads. Yes. Yes. Terrific film. And, and I was curious as to your thoughts on that. I, I, I mean, I, my, my thought is that Threads is, is harder to watch. As traumatizing as I found the day after, Threads is harder to watch. But I was, I was curious as to your thoughts on it. I'm sure it's harder to watch. And that was sort of the balancing act that I had to make because I was always worried that people would reach for the clicker uh, if, it, if it was too terrible. And it, it's pretty terrible. But I didn't want to literally turn people off. You had to somehow walk a fine line. Uh, there's a, there are other movies. Testament is another terrific movie. Um, I'm willing to concede that not only that, that, that it's harder to watch, but it may be a better made film. I didn't want mine to be a better made film. As a director, this was a counterintuitive exercise. I knew, and I was right, that people would rather discuss anything that the content of the film, that if we started talking about wasn't Jason Robards wonderful, John Lithgow work, then we'd miss. And interestingly enough, when the press got a hold of it, the big argument, they never talked about the content of the film. All they wanted to know was who started it. It was just another way of ducking out on it. And I was trying to put blinders on the audience so that they had no place intellectually or emotionally to run. There was no traction on the walls to keep them from sliding into the abyss of what we're talking about. And I thought the very banality of the film, the fact that it was a TV movie, Work for some. Some years ago, about 10 years ago, during the conspiracy about Harry and Sue, the Boston Police Force, um, and the movie from 1918, I was working on a project um, uh, to develop a, a community based web platform that would allow uh, neighborhoods uh, to, uh, to help organize uh, the events of disaster response. I my daughter was uh, delivering the play um, um, in elementary school in 2008. And, um, and I was working with the, uh, with the, uh, with the school, and, you know, just as a kind of base to build some areas of education and help them to be real in the community. And, uh, and the, the president of the, um, of, of the uh, Parents Association said, I am so glad. I'm so glad you're working on it. I can't stand to think about it. And I've had that reaction, not, not to the director. She's the only person that's ever said it that squarely to me. But I'm running a tech company, a nonprofit tech startup right now. We develop a way to, uh, to use processors and software to audit elections on a certain day. Uh, and there's probably fraud in there in that too. And there's probably the Senate majority. And so, do people go 
somebody out front that you can get to them as far as the pilot coordination process between the pilot and science team. Often you can't. <coughs> Most people want to go to a certain place in life and society and safety and security, but they only want to get to where they want to go to do what they want to do to get to the bottom of it. A lot of people do not do it. When you see something that these kids learn when they come to school, part of them can articulate strongly something to do when people are ready to do it. The other thing about this putting your head in the sand impulse because things are too horrible to think about is that it leaves a vacuum where sort of the dark princes of gloom like the Richard Pearls and people, these are the people who, or John Bolton, who sort of relish, you know, like sort of lemmings racing toward this Biblical Old Testament you know, fulfillment of ancient prophecy. Yeah, let's have the bombs out and get it over with. And, you know, catharsis. I know this at your movie. Um, people they like got the information to like this little TV and then yeah. um, only like the father say the Gulf War was like the result of actually. Like, Well, the problem, as I'm sure you're aware, is that we have now reached a critical point in this country and probably beyond, where it's very hard to tell what's true. Once you start being able to Photoshop, once you have a president who says this is fake news, once you have media that are so polarized politically that they're no longer devoted to reporting the news, but to spinning it, really, depending on their you know, political affiliations and persuasions, that, I mean, if, if you watch Fox News, there's no such thing as climate change. If you watch MSNBC, it's you know overtaking Florida and Bangladesh and, and the certain islands in the Pacific. Um, John Adams said that facts are stubborn things, but they become less stubborn when they prove sort of manipulatable by all these technological innovations that initially seemed so wonderful, so full of promise. Like most things, you know, seem wonderful and full of promise, and some of them really are. You get a polio vaccine, that's pretty cool. Smallpox vaccine, Catherine the Great, first monarch ever to be vaccinated. So. Um, but a lot of other things, like the internet, like Facebook, like Photoshop, a new voice technology that can sample your voice and make you say anything. And who knows what's real? And if we're endlessly debating what's real, it's very hard to get anything done. Yes? Along those lines, um, my daughter is in you know, classes and she's in school with them also. And if you watch the movie and talk to her, she knows she thinks I'm fascinating and so forth. <laughs>
there are, there, there is certainly, I made another movie about this subject, which believe it or not is called Star Trek VI, The Undiscovered Country. And Star Trek VI is about the collapse of the Soviet Union. Or we would call them the Klingons. And we call their leader Gorkhan, which is as close as we can get to Gorbachev. Yeah. <laughs> and it is a movie that was somewhat predicated on the Harvard conservative philosopher Francis Fukuyama's notion that we've reached the end of history. And that people can be very frightened of change. And basically, the plot of the movie is an attempt to preserve that one-on-one, -on -one, eyeball to eyeball, what they used to call mutually assured destruction, man, between the United States and the Soviet Union. That that was ironically more comforting, more reassuring than the idea of some guy with a suitcase wandering into Union Station with an atom bomb. And you'll never know why, you'll never know what happened, you'll just, you know, be toast. And you, 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 won't, you won't even know it happened, let alone why. Some of my students watch this movie, and um, the part that they were most sort of intrigued by was not actually the, the launching or the, the initial destruction, but the whole hour after that, right? Well, that's the heart of the movie. And um, and I wanted to ask you, like, what made you, how did you decide how much of the movie you wanted to dedicate? We, one of the things I thought was very powerful is that you did spend a lot of time in the movie helping to get to know the characters so that then when that happened, right, and they sort of had this impression that, like, well, nuclear war, then it's, everybody's dead, but we can still work. And to have it sort of 45 minutes into the movie and then for us to watch that happen, how did you make that choice about how much of the movie to dedicate and why did you Movie directors like to take credit for you know everything they can. This script was written by a man named Ed Hume. And Ed Hume really, I thought, did a very thoughtful and sensitive job of getting you involved with these people's lives. Remember that the first part of the movie, for those of you who haven't seen it, um, is devoted to people going about their business, they're planning a wedding, they're you know, going on leave from the army. There are all these different things that were happening. But at the same time, the second function that is being performed by his very clever script are all the radio and television bulletins that are, you know, sort of speckled like wallpaper throughout the background. Most people aren't even paying any attention to vague news about things happening over there, which, by the way, is the way Americans have always felt until 2011, is... Our oceans protect us. It's over there. You know, isolationism. I don't want to get involved over there, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Um, So between the mounting, what really holds your interest in these characters, I think, are those bulletins going on in the background. And you, it's, it's, it's like a horror movie where you're going to say, look under the door, look under the, you know, and they're not. They're just making the bed. Um, but there's, at a certain point, what the movie was really saying is, you know, the dead are going to be the lucky ones. The movie is about the ones who aren't so lucky. And that's why we spend so much time saying, if you're going to have a nuclear war, this is what it's going to be like on a good day. And by a good day, I mean, we didn't show nuclear winter. There was a movie made for uh, British television. That was so horrifying that they wouldn't put it on the air. So I couldn't have that. So that sort of is the basis of it. Yes? So we have this ongoing existential threat of nuclear warfare. We have other existential, existential threats. The one that uh, I'm concerned about is climate change. Me too. We don't really, I mean, aside from. But we know the climate change, wars, excuse me, is a Chinese hoax. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you know, aside from some of the things that have been out there, and they take a scientific perspective, which I think is good, 
we don't have anything that sort of, as far as I know, that sort of dramatizes what I feel the movie did and the effects of this. I mean, it's such a slow moving Well, are you aware of movies out there that might have that effect? Or could you make a movie? <laughs> um, <clears throat> my answer is going to be discouraging because th there are movies about climate change and we call them disaster movies. Yeah. And people get off on them. They think it's funny when New York gets swamped. Like, you know, a lot of people wait for New York to get swamped. Um, but one of the things interesting is that we could have made the special effects of this movie much more elaborate and arguably convincing. I didn't want it. Because then we talk, talk about how great the special effects were. So I didn't want that either. And it's exactly what happens when they've made movies, and recent movies, about climate change, where New York City gets flooded and other things happen. Because we all get off on the, on the effects and the eye candy of it. I think you have a better chance with you know, documentaries like Al Gore's Inconvenient Truth and stuff. And the thing about climate change unlike nuclear war, is nuclear war is going to last 20 minutes. Um, so that's a good thing to do. Climate change is incremental. So we're all watching while Florida goes underwater, while Bangladesh goes underwater, while certain islands in Polynesia go underwater. Um, and people, and, and as weather changes, Storms become more severe, and I, you know, places on the East Coast are destroyed, or Texas is destroyed. It becomes harder and harder to avoid the topic, which may ultimately, if belatedly, get people to, you know, every time he says this is a Chinese hoax, it sounds stupider and stupider, at least to me. So I don't, you know, I, I don't know how you make a movie. You know, it would have to almost be a time lapse movie of people going about their business in Miami, and over <laughs> years, you just see that the, they're wading through more and more water. So I don't know the answer off the top of my head. What keeps you up at night? Well, I worry about climate change. I, to be really honest, I worry about Donald Trump. I think he's a sort of quadruple threat. I think he's out of his mind. I think he's very stupid. I think he's amazingly arrogant. I think he's a chronic liar. Um, and he's got his finger on what he insists is a bigger button than Kim Jong-un's. Uh, and I, I sense that people around him have a full-time job trying to rein in his more infantile but destructive and dangerous impulse. I'm sorry if I am offending anybody, but that's, you ask and I'm answering. I watch this country, a whole portion of it, become increasingly divided into like a second civil war between people who Think that the Constitution is something that really doesn't quite exist except for the Second Amendment, which, in my opinion, if you look at that comma, is arguably misinterpreted anyway. And the internet seems to have reinforced partisanship. It seems to reinforce incivility. You don't talk to each other politely when no one can see what you're saying while you're at the keyboard. And we can insult people ad lib. I think we, we don't make decisions with our brains except some sort of hard wiring that allows, we can't even agree on what we're talking about. So for example, on the one hand, you have people talking about a woman's right to choose. And on the other hand, they say, no, that's not the issue. The issue is murder. So where is the middle ground where we can acknowledge differences of opinion and reach something that has now become a dirty word, which is compromise. And compromise is the heart of the democratic process. 
you don't always get all of what you want. You don't always get it when you want it. And having when he starts going after judges, which is the latest thing, that scares me. I I I always loved this country. I thought it was the best country. I thought George Washington, that's my hero. The American Revolution, the only revolution that ever worked. Hello. Founded by a clique of geniuses, okay, they were white. But they were geniuses. And it's the only one that ever worked. They all all fallen apart. And I don't want to see this one play out yet. That's just me. I'm deeply suspicious of when somebody, I think Dr. Johnson said, patriotism is the last refuge of a scoundrel. <laughs> the idea of wrapping yourself up in the flag and defying anybody to dispute your opinions or your logic. It's terrifying. Yes? Yes? Uh, earlier, at the beginning of your talk, you talked about this film and films like this leading to activism, and you made like a comment about John Carpenter as well. And so I was wondering if you could expand on what you were thinking about in terms of how you would still get this in the film. Well, the film did lead to activism. It's, 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 it, was, it, it was all part of and promoted by the nuclear freeze movement who seized on it. I would like to think that a school shooting or several is not the necessary prerequisite for getting people off their rear ends and into the streets. I don't believe that change happens in a computer. I believe you have, when I, when I was a kid and protesting the Vietnam War, we marched. And when we got through marching, we picketed. And we just stayed doing it. And there seems to be an apathy which has settled in as though our abilities to shape our destinies are somehow beyond us, that we can't affect a change. And those children are showing us that we can, and we should, and that pass, you know, passivity is death. And sitting behind your screen, whether it's your phone or your Xbox, whatever the hell it is, that's death. Somebody wrote a book a few years ago called Amusing Ourselves to Death. Where we're not being participants, and we think somebody else is doing it. And elites are separating. The middle class doesn't, no one could afford the house that my dad bought when we were growing up. Now, it's some hedge fund guy. I mean, what the hell is that? We're, and schools, every school should be like this school. All public schools should be like this school, but we've pissed that all away. Forget public education and just argue about what's in the textbooks. Are we going to mention evolution? Well, the guys who published the textbooks now have the ability to pull out certain paragraphs that are troubling. You know what John Adams said that facts mm. are trouble, stubborn things. He said, John Adams said, facts are stubborn things. But if you can start manipulating facts, and do certain brand things you don't like, or fake news, people get lost. And when they get lost, they feel helpless. And when they feel helpless, they get passive. What good can I do? That's the way I, I felt. I was lucky. Somebody you know, gave me this thing. And I, I wasn't, I wasn't going to do it. I didn't want to do it. So I'm awful glad I, I did. And I just want other people to get in the act. Yes, I remember I saw the movie when it was on TV. When you were 12, yes. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> Very kindly. Um, I was three when I made it. <laughs> um, I remember the panel discussion of the zapper, at least I remember there was one. And this is the one person I remember the most was Henry Kissinger. Yes, we cannot make nuclear policy by scaring ourselves to death. Something like that. I remember him saying three or four times, simple minded, but when he talked about the movie, I was wondering if you would have had a chance to talk with him about his reaction to these impacts. I'll tell you the funny the, the answer, the short answer is no. The longer answer is thank God. Um, <laughs> but I am very close friends with his son, who is as far 
away from his father politically. He loves his father. But a couple of years ago, in uh, 2012, whatever it was, um, we know each other from the dog park. And he, he's the producer for Conan O'Brien's company. He's a very nice, very sweet guy. And he said, I'll, I won't be here next week or the week after. I said, where are you going? He said, I'm going to Ohio to register Democrats. That's how far away he is from his dad. I, the issue, the, the television program was called Nightline. It was the most widely watched Nightline. Before Reagan saw the movie, he was very frightened about the movie. And this is a, another whole story about the day after and the Joint Chiefs having to watch the movie at the Pentagon. And a childhood friend of mine who was affiliated with the State Department, Shrink, being called in to watch the movie with the Joint Chiefs. And we hadn't spoken in 10 years. He didn't know that it was my movie. He said, Nikki, imagine my surprise. And David Gergen, who was then the press secretary, saying the president wants to know what we're going to do about this movie. And they eventually decided, I'm shortening this, to um, send Secretary of George of State, George Schultz, before Nightline, after the movie. He came on, and Ted Koppel said, Secretary Schultz, is this the way it's going to be? And Secretary Schultz clinched it by saying, no, Ted, this is not the way it's going to be. And so the whole country was allowed to chill out. That was their initial response. The Nightline thing, which we watched, which had Carl Sagan and Elliot Wiesel, Kissinger, William Buckley, the usual suspects. Um, and Kissinger said, I don't think the right way to make nuclear policy is by scaring myself to death. And I'm shouting back at the screen. And I had a voice, and I said, A, I think it's exactly the way to make nuclear policy, and B, it's the way we made nuclear policy for the past 40 years. It's called mad, mutually assured destruction. And that is scary myself. And I was right. <laughs> <laughs> so that, that was my... You know, there are other parts of this, this story. They, they ran this movie, The Joint Chief. My friend was sitting there. And he said, there wasn't a snicker, there wasn't a murmur. He said, if you wanted to draw blood over there, you did. And he saw one guy, I can't remember which branch of the service, who was clearly very upset. <coughs> and Steve said to him, you know, the movie got to you? He said, yeah. And he said, what got to you most? And he said, this is what got to you. That he couldn't imagine. It had to be shown. Movies have their uses. Well, I think I've warned you enough. <laughs> and you can say the same for me. Thank you. Before we let you go, we want to give you a small token that's very important to us as a community, and it's a book called Dignity. And um, I think it aligns very well with your message because to treat people with dignity, we need to believe that they have value and that they're valuable. And I think in some sense your movie is about that. So we'll be right in it. <laughs> well, I'll never read anything on the side. <laughs>